Good afternoon. My name is Laura Gerard, and on behalf of the UNC Learning Center staff and the General Alumni Association, I would like to welcome you to the 18th annual Burnett Seminar for Academic Achievement. We're so very fortunate to have the opportunity to host this event, thanks to the generosity of the Burnett family. This was started by Mr. Timothy Burnett's late mother, Ms. Juliette Davis, and her late husband, Mr. W. Burke Davis, and ongoing support has been provided by Mr. Timothy Burnett and Mrs. Jane Burnett. The Burnett Seminar allows us to bring the latest information in the field to the people who deserve to hear it the most. Teens and young adults diagnosed with ADHD and LD, their families, and the professionals who work with them. Please join me in thanking and welcoming Timothy and Jane Burnett, who are here with us today. Also with us today are Dr. Marcus Collins, Associate Dean of the Center for Student Success and Academic Counseling, and Dr. Kim Abels, Director of the Writing and Learning Center here at UNC. I would also like to welcome back Dr. Teresa Maitland, a longtime member of our Learning Center staff who is instrumental in developing our Learning Center model. Thank you all for being here. It takes the time and talents of many people in order for an event like this to take place. So I would like to take just a brief moment to extend my gratitude to many who have contributed their energy and efforts. First of all, thank you to all of the Learning Center staff who have contributed in some way. Would you please stand? Okay. <laughs> Specifically, I would like to thank Morgan Souza, Sarah Esposito, and Ben Grace for their tremendous efforts. I would like to thank Robert Biggers and his staff from the Bull's Head Bookstore for being here. And I would like to thank Paul LaMontagne for handling all of our audiovisual needs. Thank you as well to Douglas Payne from the General Alumni Association and to JJ Oppegard from the Carolina Club for their many contributions. For some quick housekeeping items today, our agenda is in your program, and we're going to vary a little bit from that. Um, we are going not to have a break at 2 o'clock, but instead, Mr. Mooney will speak um, and do his entire presentation, after which we'll take a short break, have some refreshments, and then come back for Q&A after that. So there's a little slight, slight change there. Um, if you would like to purchase any of Jonathan Mooney's books, they will be for sale over here to the left um, during that time and then after the, um, the Q&A at the very end. Additionally, Mr. Mooney will be available for book signings at the end as well. On your seat, you should have an index card. If you have any questions, please write them on the index card and after the presentation, we will collect those and um, use those for questions to ask. Restrooms are located on both floors down the hall to your left. Um, if you have any questions about anything, our Learning Center staff have blue name tags, so feel free to approach us with any questions you might, ha might have. We are thrilled today to have Jonathan Mooney returning to speak with us after his dynamic presentation here in 2009 at the Burnett Seminar. Jonathan is a neurodiversity and learning activist and writer who just published his third book. Less than two weeks ago, he had an op-ed article in the New York Times where he wrote about valuing all human beings for who they are. He's also been featured and quoted in numerous other places like the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, NPR, HBO, and ABC News. He graduated from Brown University where he co-founded Project Eye to Eye, a nonprofit advocacy organization for students with learning differences. He has been and continues to be a huge proponent for the concept that being different does not mean being deficient, for celebrating the power of being different, for not striving for or enforcing normalcy on anyone, and for speaking out about injustice. He speaks across the nation about neurological and physical diversity, inspiring those who live with differences and advocating for change. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Mr. Jonathan Mooney. Hey, I want to give a big old shout out uh, to the folks who make this happen. Uh, I want to recognize the university, 
I want to thank the Alumni Center. I want to thank all of the people at the Learning Support Center. But I want to give a special thank you to the Burnett family. Because this is not the first one of these events. This is not the fifth one of these events. This is not the tenth one of these events. This is the 18th. And that is a profound commitment to making sure that we have schools and ultimately a world that don't just work for some people, but work for all people. And that deserves a big old round of applause. Can you all do that? Uh, okay, with all that said and done, uh, let me get right to it, you know. I, I was really asked here today to share with you my personal experience of being a young person who struggled in school because of learning and attentional differences. Uh, and I did struggle. You know, I was the kid who had such a hard time sitting still that I spent most of the day chilling out with the janitor in the hallway, right? Uh, I was the kid who had such a hard time keeping his mouth shut that I grew up on a first name basis with Shirley, the receptionist, in the principal's office, right? Uh, and I was the kid in high school who had such a hard time with reading that I spent most of my high school experience hiding in the bathroom to escape reading out loud with tears streaming down my face. Uh, I didn't learn to read until I was 12. Couldn't read until I was 12 years old. Growing up, I had every label you could imagine. I was called the dumb kid. I was called the bad kid. I was called the lazy kid. And eventually, I became the special ed kid. I was diagnosed with a continuum of language-based learning disabilities in third grade, dyslexia, dysgraphia, and others. I was diagnosed with ADD, which I think we all know stands for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in fourth grade. And I dropped out of school for about a year in sixth grade. That year when I left school, I had a number of mental health challenges. I struggled with anxiety, I struggled with depression, and I had a plan for suicide. I spent about a year after I left school in and out of a variety of different educational environments. You know, I went to special education schools for a second, I went to alternative schools for a minute, and then if I'm honest with you all, I went to no school. I was at home trying to rebuild a sense of self, a sense of efficacy, and frankly, a sense of value as a human being. So you can imagine by the time I got into middle school and beyond, there were all sorts of low expectations that surrounded me. Low expectations that too often surround people with learning and attentional differences. You know, I heard it all. Uh, I was told by my father that I'd most likely end up a high school dropout. Uh, I was told by a counselor that I'd most likely end up unemployed, and I was told by a teacher that I'd most likely end up in jail or incarcerated. So I was asked here today to talk about how I beat those odds, how I transcended those low expectations, because it goes without saying that none of those very hopeful prophecies came to pass in my life or in my education. You know, opposed to being a high school dropout, as my dad thought, I became a college graduate. As you heard, I graduated from Brown University, which I'm sure many of you know is an Ivy League university with an honors degree in, of all things, English literature, right? Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, opposed to being unemployed, you know, uh, I ended up writing books. First book I wrote as an undergraduate at Brown University. And opposed to being an inmate, you know, I became an advocate. Somebody who has dedicated his entire professional life to making the world a better place for folks who learn outside the line. So I was asked here today uh, to talk about that journey of change and transformation. I was asked here today to answer a very valid question, a question that might be in your mind, a question I'm asked all the time when people hear about that journey of change and transformation. You know, I'm asked by moms and dads, I'm asked by students, I'm asked by educators, hey, Jonathan, how'd you do it, right? How could you go from a sixth grade dropout who could not read 
at 12 years old to an Ivy League English major published author, what drugs did you take and where can I buy some, right? I know that's a question on y'all's mind and that's the question that I want to answer with you today. I want to talk about the things that put me on a different path. I want to share with you the research that we know more than ever puts young folks with learning and attentional differences on a journey of change. But not only do I want to share with you some very practical information about what it means to empower folks with learning and attentional differences, I also want to challenge the subtext that is often underneath that question that I'm asked. You know, when people come to my story and they say, hey man, how'd you do it? Really what they want to ask me, if they're being honest, is hey Jonathan, how did you fix yourself? Because there's a deeply held belief that these are deficiencies inside of a person and for somebody with these deficiencies to be okay in the world, they got to stop being different and fix their problem. But the reality is these things aren't deficiencies, as I'll share with you today. They are differences, and they deserve not to be pathologized and fixed, but celebrated and included as a part of the continuum of human diversity. So I want to talk with you today not about a diagnosis fix it model. I want to talk about a diversity empowerment model and how you all can be ambassadors to that idea in the lives of the young people that you care about, in the lives of your students, your children, and ultimately how we can be ambassadors and advocates for that idea in the broader world. So when I think about what does it mean to have an empowerment approach, for a student who learns differently, there are three things that constitute empowerment. I wanna share these three things with you now. We'll take a break and then we'll come on back and we'll have a dialogue question conversation about these three ideas. So for me, first and foremost, empowerment starts only when we redefine who or what we call the problem. You know, for most of human history, we have called normal, good, and right, and different, deficient, and bad. And we have put the problem in the person, right? You know, I know that very personally, right? I remember when I was diagnosed in third grade, and the school psychologist called me and my mom into the office to give us that news. And the moment me and my mom walked into that office, it was obvious that everybody in that room thought we were getting terrible, tragic news. You know, the lights were down low. There was jazz music playing in the background. There was a box of tissues on the table, right? because we were there to mourn the death of my normality, you know? We put the problem in the person and we pathologize or turn difference into deficiency. But the reality is that the problem's not in me. It's not with the difference. It's with the way that difference is treated in certain contexts. Let me use my life experience as a way to illuminate that paradigm shift of what we call the problem. Let's take this thing we call ADD, right? You know, read all the research literature. Go to every single seminar by Russell Barkley. And it implies that I have a deficient, defective brain. Forget imply. Listen to the language we use. Jonathan has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We put the problem in the person. But the reality is this thing that we have all been acculturated to call a deficiency or disorder is a difference in the truest sense of the word. A difference with challenges, don't get me wrong, not naive about those challenges, and a difference with strengths and gifts that we don't talk enough about. 
You know, I got that there are things that I struggle with. You know, I struggle with executive functioning. I struggle with organization. I have explored the feasibility of stapling my car keys to my forehead, all right? I got that. Those are very real challenges that are neurobiologically based in their nature. But do you know what goes hand in hand with those very real challenges? A whole bunch of very real strengths and gifts that we don't talk enough about. You know, there's good research that shows that people with atypical attention are better problem solvers than the general population. Came across a research study recently that showed that EMTs, emergency medical professionals, firemen and women with ADD are better, better at their job than so-called normal EMTs. That, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, your house is on fire? You want that dude to have ADD, right? <laughs> I mean, forget paying attention, come get my cats, you know? So it's a difference with a whole bunch of strengths and a whole bunch of weaknesses that go hand in hand, but it is not my problem. My problem is not ADD, my problem is the school desk. How in God's name could a school desk be a kid's problem? Well, let me immerse you into my relationship with the school desk, and it is a fraught relationship, right? You know, for some kids, school desk, not a big deal. It is a benign piece of school furniture. For me, the school desk might as well be a form of enhanced interrogation that would make Dick Cheney proud, okay? This is my experience at the school desk. This is first grade, this is 12th grade, this is Brown University, doesn't matter. I see that desk, I see that chair, and before I even sit in it, my hands start to sweat. My face gets all red because I know after five seconds at the desk, the foot's gonna start bouncing. 10 seconds at the desk, both feet start bouncing. 15 seconds at the desk. Oh, I'm gonna bust out the drums. 15 minutes at the desk, it is all over. I'm the kid trying to take my leg and put it behind my neck, right? And that young person is shamed for that behavior because we have built an institution that has a narrow definition of the good kid. We confuse or conflate being good with being compliant. And if you're not the kid that can't sit still and raise their hand and keep their mouth shut, well, guess what? Something is wrong with you. You know, I got that message at home. I grew up in a pretty old school Irish Catholic household. So every night at the dinner table with my dad, it was Jonathan, stop it, stop it, stop it. What is wrong with you? And I got the same message in some of my classrooms. Not all of my classrooms, don't get me wrong, but some of them. I'll never forget, I had a teacher in second grade named Mrs. C. I've had many, many gifted, brilliant teachers in my life who I will celebrate with you today. Mrs. C is not one of those, okay? <laughs> My foot would be bouncing, she would stop class, she would point at me, all the kids would look at me, and she would say at the top of her lungs, Jonathan, what is your problem? We put the problem in the person. When the reality is, the problem's not the person, the problem is a passive learning environment where kids spend on average 75% of the day sitting still. The problem is the narrow definition of what constitutes being good that conflates it with compliance. And ultimately the problem is the sense of shame and social stigma that comes from being called the problem. That's the problem. Let me give you one of the best examples of that I've seen, you know. I spent a lot of time talking to young folks. It's one of the best things I do in my life. And back in the day, I gave a talk 
in Green Bay, Wisconsin, to third graders. And I walked in to give this presentation, and from the front of the room, I could see in the back of the room a set of boxes made out of bookshelves about three feet tall. So they had taken these bookshelves, they made a box this big, and in one of the boxes, I could see a head <laughs> bouncing up and down. It was one of the third graders in the box jumping, right? Now that's not a sight you see all the time, you know? So I turned to the teacher, and with all due respect, I said, hey man, uh, what's up with the box, you know? What's going on? And the guy looked at me without a hint of irony nor sarcasm, and he said, Jonathan, that is Jack. I said, you have a Jack in the box? Are you kidding me? <laughs> poor, poor little Jack in the back of the room in a box. Hey, I don't gotta belabor this point. ADD ain't Jack's problem. The box is Jack's problem. Difference disabled by context. And the same is true with my so-called learning disabilities. You know, a lot of folks come to my story and they say, hey man, it must be terrible to be dyslexic. And you know what? It ain't. It's not that big of a deal, you know? I'm not naive about the challenges that come with having my brain, and those challenges are real, but there's also a whole bunch of good things that come with having my brain that we don't talk enough about. You know, those challenges, like ADD, are neurobiologically based in their nature. It comes from a different brain structure, and that led me to have challenging experiences with reading. You know, I still struggle with reading. I read in the 12th percentile. I spell at a third grade level. I confuse words that look alike. Who and how look the same to me. There and there look the same to me. Horse and house look the same to me. When I went to college, I swear to you, I thought the university offered a course in orgasmic chemistry, okay? <laughs> Imagine my disappointment on the first day of that class. <laughs> so, hey, I got that, you know? Th those are real challenges, right? But do you know what goes hand in hand with those real challenges? A whole bunch of strengths that we don't talk enough about. Do you all know that 50% of small businesses in America were founded or are run by somebody with a language-based learning difference. The engine of the American economy small business is driven by the kid who grew up hiding in the bathroom to escape reading out loud. That's real talent and real strengths. So dyslexia, different. It's not my problem. My problem is being made to feel stupid because I had a different brain. That's my problem. And that problem has an origin. And that problem is affecting more and more kids every single year. And that origin is a narrow definition of what constitutes intelligence that leaves so many human beings out. You know, we confuse, first and foremost, being smart with being good at school. But y'all know those are different things now, don't you? Don't know about you, but some of the smartest people I have ever met in my life, they didn't do school well, but guess what? They could rebuild that car engine from scratch. And that person is just as intelligent and just as valuable as that person with a PhD. And the flip side is true. Some of the stupidest people I've ever met in my life have had PhDs, right? can't get to the supermarket, you know? So we have elevated one brain, and we've called this the smart brain. And if you don't have this brain, well, guess what? Something is wrong with you. And that leaves so many human beings out. And that is wrong. And not only have we confused or conflated school and smart, but at an early age, we confuse or conflate reading and smart. You know, I know that personally, right? I'm the father of three, right? So I spend a lot of time 
hanging out with other moms and dads, play dates, drop-offs, pickups. And every time I'm hanging out with other moms and dads, all I ever hear is how smart their kids are, right? I mean, everybody has a genius on their hands in Santa Monica, California, you know? And how do they know that they got baby Einstein at home? It's always the reading. I hear things like this. I hear, oh, my kid's so smart. They're reading chapter books and they're in kindergarten. Oh, my kid's so smart. They know all their letters and they're in preschool. Oh, my kid's so smart. They know phonics and they're in utero, right? <laughs> It ain't ever my kids so smart they're good at building. It ain't ever my kids so smart they're good at talking. It ain't ever my kids so smart they're good at caring and connecting. It's a narrow band of human skills that we have decided to call smart. And not only do we call it smart culturally, but institutionally we start to track kids based on that definition. Because if you don't got the reading brain, you find yourself in the dumb group. Who remembers the dumb group, anybody? Let me ask that question differently because the reality is we all went to schools that had the smart group and the stupid group. They didn't call it that. It's not inherently, intentionally malicious, but it was there, wasn't it? Who, who, remembers, uh, who remembers reading groups? Any of y'all remember reading groups? Can I ask you a question about those reading groups? Was it ever hard to tell which reading group was the smart group and which reading group was the not smart group it wasn't hard to tell right you know you have the bluebirds over here you have the blackbirds over here and then over in the annexed trailer building you know you got the sparrows right come on now we we ain't fooling anybody let me put it this way when i was growing up everybody knew that my group was the dumb group because my group was a bird that did not fly, okay? It was an ostrich and it ran quickly, you know? And I was chilling out with C-Spot Run and everybody knew that the condors were the smart group because the condors were reading War and Peace, okay? It ain't hard to figure out. And the worst thing about it is, hey, not only do I know that I'm in the dumb group, but who else knows I'm in the dumb group? Everybody else knows I'm in the dumb group. Let me put it this way. Some of the worst memories of my life were going over to the other side of the room to pick up my little book. And let's be honest, see Spot Run? Not a bad book, right? Nice narrative structure, nice moral tale, but you don't want to be caught dead with Spot when you are 14 years old now, do you? Spot's going in the shirt. Spot's going in the backpack, because as I walk by all the other kids, I'm going to hear it. I'm going to hear, Jonathan, go back to your dumb reading group. Oh, Jonathan, go back to your stupid reading group. And then I hear a word which should be, but is not, treated as a moral equivalent of a racial slur. I hear, Jonathan, go back to your retarded reading group, because we've all been acculturated into this world where there's the smart people and there's not. We've all been acculturated into a world of norms that calls one brain smart and the other brain's not. Because we all know what gets you in the smart group and it ain't your tactile kinesthetic intelligence. It ain't your social emotional intelligence. It ain't your verbal intelligence. It's a narrow band of skills that we have decided to call smart. And that's wrong. And that's the problem, not the kids who learn differently. So in my life, it was a moment of healing and empowerment to reframe what the problem was. It's not ADD, it's the desk. It's not dyslexia, it's the reading group. It's not the difference that's the problem, it's the way the difference is treated. In an institution, that is one size fits all. And because it's one size fits all, it fits nobody. That's the problem. And that reframe, it matters. It matters because then you all can be ambassadors to a different idea, to the idea that different isn't deficient. And you can wake up every day and commit yourself to giving young people that message. 
But that shift matters as well because when we have a new definition of the problem, that the problem's not in the person but in the context, it leads us down the road of new solutions. And those new solutions bring me to the second thing that I wanted to share with you today. You know, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my mom, right? Give you a mental image of Colleen Mooney, right? So y'all can see her in your mind, you know? A lot of folks underestimated my mom. They underestimated my mom for a variety of different reasons. On one hand, my mom, underestimated, looked down upon because she's not a tall woman. On a good day, in high heels, on her tippy toes, my mom is 4'11", right? Little Irish bulldog, you know? So folks kind of look down on her. You know, my mom was also looked down upon because of her socioeconomic background, you know? Uh, her parents, uh, my grandparents, you know, Irish immigrants right off the boat working coal mines in Montana and then moved to San Francisco to clean rich people's homes. That's the environment that my mom grew up in. My mom struggled in school because the fruit does not fall fall from the tree, right? And my mom had unaddressed learning differences in her own life. My mom struggled in school. She felt stupid. She felt dumb. She was called lazy. So she dropped out. My mom never graduated from high school, never went to college. My mom had my brother when she was 19, my sister when she was 20, my other sister when she was 21, found herself a single mom on public assistance, right? So folks looked down on her for that reason. And lastly, my mom was looked down upon because she had this very funny, very high-pitched voice. My mom totally sounds like Minnie Mouse, right? My mom totally sounds like Minnie Mouse, right? So people looked down on her. She wasn't tall, she wasn't wealthy, she wasn't educated, she sounded like Minnie Mouse, but people looked down at my mom at their own peril. Because my mother, she cursed like a truck driver. And let me ask you all a question. If you were a principal or a teacher, did you want cursing Minnie Mouse in your office? <laughs> The answer to that question, if you are at all confused, is no, okay? But guess where my mom was? Every single day when things were going wrong for her son. Oh, she was in that office. How did we know she was in that office? Because every dog in the neighborhood was running away. Only bats could hear her high-pitched obscenities. Glass was shattering. My mom understood that I didn't need somebody in my life to fix me. I needed somebody in my life to fight for and with me. And that's a radical shift. Because for most of human history, not only have we called normal, good, and right, and deficient, def different deficient, we have then subsequently organized a set of interventions and systems to fix the so-called deficient person. We have a remediation industrial economy that's all about trying to make the square peg fit the round hole. But the problem is, if we try to fix the peg too much, if we try to jam that peg into the hole, it doesn't fit in. What happens to that person? Eventually, they break. We know more than ever that being seen as deficient and subsequently being fixed all the time gives you the message that you are broken as a human being. And no human being thrives feeling broken. So my mom rejected that model. My mom fought for my right to learn differently. My mom fought for the idea that if a student doesn't learn their way they're taught, well, guess what? Teach the way the student learns. My mom fought for the idea that it's not the person that should change, but the context around the person. That's what needs to change. 
And that was a radical idea back then and still today. So we need more people than ever to be advocates for the idea of students' right to learn differently. We need more cursing Minnie and Mickey Mouses than ever out there every day arguing that it's not the person that should change, but the environment. So how should the environment change for your kid, for your student, and ultimately, how should we be imagining a different context? Well, first and foremost, we need to fight for a student's rights to have services that match their learning style. You know, if you learn differently, you can't be taught the same way every other kid is taught. If you have a different approach to reading, you need to be taught in a way of reading that is aligned with your neurology. Those services matter. Fair doesn't mean equal. And a lot of young people with atypical brains and bodies aren't getting the services that they deserve. You know, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the IDEA, the Individuals with Disability Act, is a piece of legislation that has never been fully funded by any administration, Republican or Democrat. So we have to fight to fully fund that profound idea that students with differences have a place in our school and need specialized services. But you know, we gotta go beyond services because if all we do is fight for services that make the kid fit the environment, we are doubling down on fixing kids. We need to fight for a student's rights for accommodations. You know, accommodations is a different idea. It comes from the Americans with Disabilities Act. It stipulates that we have to build ramps to create access for people with atypical brains and bodies. It's not the person that changes, but the context around the person. Accommodations matter. I'm here today because of accommodations. I'm here today because of accommodations around text to speech. You know, in my day, it was books on tape, right? I mean, the thing was so big, you had to put it into a backpack and plug it into a generator, you know? And then you had Stephen Hawking in your ear all day long. But we are living in the Renaissance age of text to speech, where everyone can have access to the world's literatures through their phone. That is an accommodation that gives young people access to information and knowledge and changes their experience of school. You know, I'm here today because of the accommodation of speech to text, right? And back in my day, it was the very fancy technology of me dictating things to my mom, right? And her writing it down and us feeling ashamed of that. Like it was cheating in some way because we have this false hierarchy where reading and writing are good and listening and speaking are bad. Well, more than ever, we know that that is a false hierarchy, that the same brain pathways that are activated in reading are activated in listening, and the same brain pathways that are activated in writing are activated in speaking. So I'm here because of the ability to dictate. Because if I don't have that accommodation, guess what happens? I dumb it down, right? I only write sentences with the words that I can find in the room. And if I can't find any words in the room, I scribble monosyllabic words down so no one can read them. And then guess what? Everyone thinks that I'm dumb. And no one sees the capacities that I have. So that accommodation matters. And you know, I'm here because of accommodations around active learning. You know, when I was that kid at the desk, bouncing my foot, rocking the drums, I wasn't doing that to be disruptive. I wasn't doing that to be disrespectful. According to John Rady at Harvard's Medical School, co-author of Driven to Distraction, I was bouncing my foot because it accesses a physical motor memory that facilitates focusing. In plain English, if I don't move, guess what turns off? My brain. 
So I needed accommodations for active learning. I'm here because of those stress balls, right? I'm here because I had the chance to get up and pace back and forth in my AP English class. I'm here because I had a teacher who replaced my chair with an exercise ball. Why does that matter? Well, guess what? When I can bounce, I pay more attention, and at the same time, I got a sweet ab workout, right? Those accommodations matter. And last but not least, I'm here because of accommodations around assessment. You know, I had time extensions on exams. That matters because when you read in the 12th percentile and you got the same amount of time as everybody else, that ain't fair. Time extensions levels the playing field. And the reality is when we give a timed exam, we are not testing how well somebody knows something. We're testing how fast they know it. And why does how fast I know it trump how well I know it? Are we trying to educate a generation of Jeopardy contestants? You know, there is no pedagogical reason to not let folks have multiple ways to show what they know. So those accommodations matter. Fight for them. But I'll be real with y'all, we gotta go beyond accommodations if we wanna have a truly inclusive world because accommodation has a little bit of a negative connotation to it, doesn't it? It's kind of like that word tolerance, you know? We tolerate something we're not all that excited about, you know? Let me put it this way. When my mother-in-law comes to town, I don't celebrate her visit. I don't embrace her visit. I accommodate her visit, right? So we have to go beyond services, beyond accommodation to fight for universal design of environments. The idea that we have an ethical and moral obligation to build our school environments, our places of work, our communities around the reality of human difference. And that's what really changes people's lives. You know, let me give you one of the best examples of the power of universal design that I've encountered. You know, in research in my new book, I learned about a movement of private sector employers who are intentionally hiring people with autism or Asperger's. This is not a charity, it's a business. It's a group of businesses that see value where everyone else sees pathology and problems. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Don't know about you, but folks with autism and Asperger's, they have skills and talents that I don't have. You know, they're often good problem solvers. They're often good systems thinkers. And let's be honest, they're often more productive employees because they don't waste a lot of time on chit chats, you know? Not a lot of office cooler banter going on, you know? So I went to go visit one of these places to figure out how did they empower and unleash this difference? Did they have a fix the person model? Or did they do something else? And the moment I went on my visit, it was obvious that they were doing something else, changing the environment around people. You know, the lights were turned down low. Why does that matter? Well, guess what? A lot of the so-called behavior problems associated with autism and Asperger's comes from overstimulation. So they modified that. It was a place of active working. You could stand, you could sit, you could pace, whatever you needed to do. It was a place of choice because we know many of the neurodiverse are intrinsically motivated and focused when they choose something they care about. It was a place that was committed to changing the environment, not the person. And it changed people's lives. You know, at the end of my visit, they were generous enough to host a cocktail party reception for me. And I have to tell you, if you haven't been to a cocktail party with 500 computer programmers with autism or Asperger's, you haven't lived, right? You got yourself a new item for your bucket list, right? It was so much fun. They were so generous. It was so quiet, you know? And about halfway through the reception, I sat down at a table to join some folks and talk with them about their life. 
And the moment I sat down at that table, it was obvious that the people there had just been talking about me, right? Y'all have been there. You can tell when somebody's talking about you, right? So I turned to one of the guys. I'm like, hey, man, um, what are y'all talking about? And the guy looked at me and he said, nothing. Then I know they're talking about me, right? So I said, no, no, no. I am here to learn from you. I value your perspective. You got something to teach me. What are y'all talking about? And the guy looked at me. He looked at his buddies. He looked back at me. And he said, well, we think you're weird. <laughs> and you know what? In their normal, I was. Normal is not a fact in the world that we discover like oxygen. It's a construct we create. And the good news in that is we don't got to make the square peg fit the round hole. We can broaden the circle to include more and more types of humans. We can make decisions, have policy, and ultimately create a world that doesn't just work for some people, but ultimately works for all people. And that's empowerment, and that's real change. Okay, I got one more for y'all, right? I told you there are three things that constituted empowerment. Redefine who or what we call the problem. Number two, have new solutions. Not about fixing the person, but changing the context. And last but not least, empowerment is all about challenging that deficit model that surrounds young people who have been called not normal. You know, if you're a young person who doesn't fit our narrow and arbitrary definition of what the normal brain is, not only do you get fixed all the time, but you also hear relentlessly about what is wrong with you. You know, I know that as a kid, you know, I, I had an IEP. Y'all know what an IEP is? For those of you that don't, Individualized Education Plan, IEP. Got to be real about that thing. NSA, KGB got nothing on the IEP, okay? <laughs> They've been doing deep intel on me my whole life. Flying unmanned drone missions over my house. And it is not good news in that file, now is it? You know, a good friend of mine, mentor of mine, named Thomas Eyre. Thomas is the former secretary of special education for the US Department of Education and now a professor at Harvard. Thomas studies those files that surround kids like me. The IEPs, the 504 plans, the response to intervention plans, whatever y'all want to call it. And his research unequivocally shows that for every one strength or talent mentioned in those files, there's 25 weaknesses. A deficit model that sees young people through the lens of what is wrong at the expense of what is right. And it has devastating consequences. You know, imagine that being your life. You know, imagine coming to work and having all your colleagues talk about what's wrong with you all day long. Imagine coming home after that day and having your loved ones talk about what's wrong with you all the time. It is demoralizing and we have to flip that script and not focus on what is wrong, but elevate what is right. And I know the power of that. I know the power of that in my own life. I am here today because of a third grade teacher named Mr. R. And he's a teacher that had a relentless commitment to the idea that every single human being had something right with them. And he was committed to finding the good and building on the good. And he would ask every kid every day, what are you good at? What are you good at? What are you good at? And if you didn't know, he would come back to you and say, you know what? You're a good talker. You're a good builder. You're a good drawer. He was committed to that idea that we all got some good in us. So he would come at me, right? And he would start up with this whole, what are you good at, what are you good at thing? And I was in IEP land. So what would I say? Nothing. I'm not good at anything. I'd never heard that I had strengths or talents at all. So one day he came to me and he said, Jonathan, you are wrong about yourself. I have been watching you. And you are good at telling stories. 
Now, sometimes they're inappropriate stories you tell, but I don't care. You are so good at telling stories that you could be a writer. I was nine years old. No one had ever said that to me before. A, a, a writer? Mr. Mr. R, are you out of your goddamn mind? I can't spell, man. Guy looked at me and he said, Jonathan, in my classroom, screw spelling. Screw spelling, man, yeah! You should have seen me jump out of my body because it was the first time in my life somebody said, put aside what you can't do and focus on what you can do. And every single student has that right. We got to flip that deficit model. But not only do we have to flip that deficit model rhetorically by talking about what's right with kids, we have to flip that deficit model with where we spend our time. Because the same research by Thomas Eyre that shows that we talk about strengths one to 25 also shows that we put all of our time in fixing kids. You know, if you're a kid that struggles in school, you don't get to go to robotics class, you go to phonics class. And then you get fixed after school and on the weekends and then over the summer, it is a relentless time investment in what's wrong and not what's right. So we gotta fight to flip that. And you know, in my life, my mom fought to invest in the good. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. And it was a big old fight. When I was a kid, my mom, the biggest fight was around spelling, right? You know, when I was a kid, every Friday was spelling test day. What a wonderful way to end the week, you know? <laughs> and and y'all know a kid like me, every day leading up to spelling test day was fix Jonathan's spelling, right? I'd get my words on Monday and I would do two hours of flashcards to get the words in. And then on Tuesday, I would draw the words in the sand. And then on Wednesday, I would build the words with blocks. And then on Thursday, I would do interpretive dance to get the words in, right? <laughs> and what happened every single Friday? I failed that test. Every Friday, we'd spend all our time focusing on what's wrong, never talking about what's right. But not this one Friday. Never forget, I came on down from the from the uh, bedroom to the breakfast table. And usually we did some more remediation before the test, right? You know, flashcards with the Pop-Tarts, right? But not this one Friday. This one Friday I came on down, there were no flashcards. I said, hey, Ma, what's up? And my mom said, Jonathan, today we are ditching school and going to the zoo. And every Friday for one year, me and my mom ditched school and did something I cared about. She called it get good at something day. You know, I was in love with animals. So we went to the zoo and I learned a lot about ecosystems. I was the builder kid, right? Always taking things apart, putting it back together. So we went on some Fridays to the construction site and I learned about the relevance of math. Some Fridays we went to improv class because in the school day I was getting detentions for making jokes. But at improv class, I was getting applause, right? We flipped that script and we invested our time in building on something a kid was good at. And I survived school because it gets good at something today. You know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that day. A long time ago, I was asked by the USA Today, by a reporter when they did an article about on my first book. And the reporter said, Jonathan, hey, give us an inspiring message about how you made it to Brown University for the young people of America. And I said, well, ditch school, you know? Because if we're real about it, we ain't doing get good at something day at school. We're doing fix what's wrong with you. And you know, people who thrive don't get good at everything. They get good at something. And they've built a life around their passions, their interests, and their talents. What do they do about the things that they're not so good at? 
Well, they do what we all do, which is use teams, technology, and support to mitigate weakness and scale and build on strength. You know, that's what I did. Mr. R was right. I am good at telling stories. So I became a writer, but I don't spell well. How do I overcome that? Well, guess what? I married my spell checker, right? It's called strategic mating, and if you haven't tried it, <laughs> you should try it, right? Every single kid has something right with them, and my challenge to you is to find it, to name it, and to grow it. That's your job. You know, I learned the power of that, not just in my own life, but I learned the power of that in the work I do in Los Angeles. One of the things I do in LA is I work with some very vulnerable young folks through a organization called Thrively, which is committed to building strength-based pathways for every single human being. And one of the first kids I worked with was a rough kid named Juan. Never forget Juan. Juan was arrested when he was 13 for running a 50-person drug ring in South Central Los Angeles. He struggled in school. He was in special ed. He couldn't read. He couldn't write. He dropped out. He felt stupid. So he joined the family business. He got arrested. He went to jail. He got out. He came to my program. He sat across from me at the interview, and he was honest. He said, you know what? I don't want to be that person. What I did was wrong, but what am I supposed to do, he said to me. He said, I am stupid. I am not good at anything. And I looked at Juan. I thought about his life. And I thought about Mr. R in my life. And I said to myself, I have an obligation to be a Mr. R in somebody else's life and a chance. So I looked at Juan. I said, Juan, not good at anything. 50 person drug ring. I said, you're an entrepreneur, brother. Now I was honest with Juan. I said, Juan, we got to get you a different product, you know? We got to get you some stocks or some sneakers or something to sell, man. But right there are skills and talents that you can use to build a better life. So Juan enrolled in our program, studied uh, small business development at a community college. He studied graphic design because he's a gifted artist who misapplied his creativity onto the side of your building, right? He merged the two and he created a small business that helped advertisers engage urban millennial youth. And Juan became not only the first in his family to go to and graduate from college. Juan became the first in his family to earn a legitimate living wage. Did we fix what was wrong with Juan? No, we did not. We scaled what was right. And every single human being has that right to have an education grounded, not in what is wrong, but what they are good at. Not in their deficits, but in their strengths, gifts, and talents. And that commitment puts somebody like Juan and me and any kid out there on a different path. Okay, I wanna conclude. And in concluding, I, I wanna come back to what this is all about, you know? Helping young people succeed with learning differences. It is all about redefining who or what's called the problem. It's all about being advocates for not fixing the person, but changing the context. And it's all about fighting for every kid's right to have an education grounded in their strengths and talents. But ultimately, for a young person to not just succeed with learning differences, but ultimately for them to heal from the wound of being called less than, of being called broken, of being called not normal. Healing from that wound requires us to reject the idea that there's a normal body or mind that we all should have. And I know that healing personally, and I wanna tell you about that. You know, when I was in college, uh, I co-founded this nonprofit organization called Eye to Eye. And Eye to Eye's got a simple mission. It takes adults, often college students, or high school students, and it matches them with younger students who have similar learning differences. It's all about the power of knowing you're not alone, you're not broken, there's hope for your future. Eye to Eye right now is a national organization celebrating its 20th 
year in existence run by my good friend named David Flink. It's all over the country. But when we started Eye to Eye, there wasn't 20 of us. There wasn't 20 chapters. There wasn't 20 states. There was five of us. Five Brown University students with learning differences, five third graders with learning differences in a special education room on the south side of Providence. And I'll be real with y'all, it was a fake it till you make it kind of thing, you know? We had no idea what we were doing. We just showed up, right? And then we paired off and we shared our stories with a student. And I was paired with this young man named Juan and I shared my stories with him for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then I took a break from him because it was my program. I felt the obligation to walk around the room and make sure that everything was going okay. So I went around to observe the different pairs. And the first pair I walked up to, they were quite a sight to see. The third grader, his name is Philip. And Philip was a hurting kid. Philip, ADD, anxiety, depression, and school phobia. If you don't know school phobia, it ain't all that complicated. He would hide under the bed in the morning, beg his grandma not to make him go to school. When he got to school, he was so nervous at school that he would rub his left eyebrow raw. So when I met Philip, he had no left eyebrow. And then there was his mentor, a gentleman, Brown University student named Kent Roberts. And Kent Roberts is a good friend of mine to this day. So when I say this, I mean it as a compliment. Kent Roberts is a complete freak show, okay? He's got a long beard down to here. He's got long hair down to here. The guy totally looks like Jesus, right? I mean, get him some Birkenstocks and a staff and you got JC in the flesh, right? So they're quite a sight to see. You got no eyebrow looking Kent, uh, Philip and you got Jesus looking Kent, right? So I walk up to observe their interaction and make sure everything's going okay. And the moment I get within five feet of Kent and Philip, I hear Kent screaming at the top of his lungs at Philip. And Philip is nine years old. And Kent is screaming, Philip, if you learn one thing in eye to eye, you have to learn that normal people suck, Philip. They suck. That's not what Jesus says, man. I mean, come on now. I am in a public elementary school. I think the cops are coming next, right? So I go home that night, and I'll be honest with y'all, I am furious, you know? I wanted to do eye to eye as my profession upon graduation, and there is no federal funding for an organization whose mission is to curse at children, okay? So I call Kent on the phone, and I'll be real with you, I yell at him for about 10 minutes. How could you say that? Why did you say that? What were you thinking saying that? And Kent didn't say a word until the very end of the call. All he said was, it's true, and hung up the phone, right? <laughs> So I'm thinking maybe, just maybe, water under the bridge, you know? No principal was there. No, pri no teacher heard it. Right, on, right under the rug, you know? Wrong. Next morning, I get a call from the principal of the Fox Point Elementary School, Principal Mary Brennan, and I am respectfully summoned to her office to discuss what transpired at eye to eye. And so I drive to the office thinking of all the ways I could apologize for messing this kid up, you know? So to confirm my fears, when I get to the office, not only is it the principal, but it's also Philip's grandma, because he lives full time with grandma. And if I've learned one thing in my brief life, it is do not mess with grandma, right? Because the moment I walk into that room before I can sit down, she stands up and she points at me. And she says, what did you do to my grandson? said, nothing, it was that Kent guy, you know? <laughs> hey, Jesus or not, I threw Kent right under the grandma bus, you know? 
never seen him before, never met him. He appeared out of nowhere, right? She had tears in her eyes. She said, for three years, my grandsons hid under the bed before school. For three years, from our home to our school, my grandson's been in tears begging me to go back. But today, the day after eye to eye, my grandson was up early, waiting in the car, ready to go to school. What did you do to my grandson? I looked at her and I said, well, it was my good friend, Kent Roberts. <laughs> And you know, it wasn't me, it, it was Kent. You know, for the first time in Philip's life, he heard, you're not broken. And for the first time in my life, I believed I wasn't broken. And that's all because of Kent. And Kent's right. You know, this idea that there is a normal which looms over all of us. That's what's broken. You know, normal is like the horizon. You think you're getting closer to it. It just gets further and further away from you. Y'all know that the word normal did not enter the English language until the 1860s. It emerged within a social context in which there was an economic imperative to make us all the same, opposed to celebrate and empower what makes us different. And normal has been used in nefarious ways to wound other human beings. It's been used to call some people right and good and the rest of us wrong and bad and broken. And Kent had the courage to say, nah, -uh, no more, normal's gotta go. Because the reality is the only normal people are people you don't know very well. Because the moment you get to know another human being, the moment that you see that human being, not for who they should be, but for who they really are, it is their eccentricities, it is their strengths, it is their weaknesses, it's their ability and their disability, it is their differences that constitute their humanity. You know, difference is true. Difference is a fact in the world. And so we are, are a part of a movement a part of a movement here today to celebrate the strengths and gifts that don't come despite learning and intentional differences. They come because of learning and intentional differences. We are here today to build a world that empowers those differences. So that kid in the hallway can become the next CEO. So that kid hiding in the bathroom can become the next artist. We need those kids more than ever. But ultimately, we together are a part of a movement that's fighting for every single human being's right to be different. Okay, thank you all so very much to listen to me talk. I so appreciate it. We're gonna get started on the Q&A now. Um, well, we got a little like a, uh, tech difficulty, so I'm going to um, uh, use what my third grade teacher called my outside voice. Uh, so I want to make sure that it, it works for y'all. Can you hear me in the back? Are we cool? Yeah, oh, you can hear me way in the back. Okay, I like it. Um, so we have about, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 minutes, uh, I think, to, to, to talk together in this forum. Um, I will hang out uh, uh, afterwards until... Uh, the last person who has a question gets their question answered or until they kick us out, one of the two. Um, so if you have a question that you don't wanna ask in the group, because I know that sometimes uh, personal questions are hard to ask in a public forum, uh, then uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask it uh, in a more intimate setting when we're all done. Uh, so we got about 25 minutes, as I said. Does that sound right, about 25? Okay, great. Uh, and. Uh, I think maybe you collected some questions. Is that how it's going down? Okay, cool. Uh, so we got questions here. Um, do you just want to read it to me? How do you want to do this? Great. And then I'll, I'll share it with everybody. Yeah. 
Yeah, good, great question. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna reiterate everyone's question because I know we're 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 uh, uh, working around the mic issue. So uh, you know uh, I talked about students who um, struggle uh, uh, academically. Uh, what about ones who uh, are okay academically but struggle socially? And, and what about the ones that that you know struggle uh, uh, in both domains? Right? Like we can talk about both those things at the same time. So. Uh, first of all, let me just validate the question. Um, it is not uncommon in, in any way for young folks with uh, learning and attentional differences and uh, many forms of neurodiversity to struggle in social contexts. Uh, the root of that struggle uh, is multifaceted. Uh, there are both uh, individual roots and then there are sort of systemic roots. So let me start with the uh, systemic uh, part of this, and then I'll talk about the personal part and about how we can support uh, those young people. So uh, the systemic thing is, hey, you know what? We, we got to be real about this. Um, young folks with learning differences, uh, young folks with ADD, uh, young folks on the uh, continuum of neurodiversity around autism or Asperger's, they are bullied at exponential rates, exponential rates. Um, I wrote an op-ed two weeks ago that was briefly alluded to in my introduction in the New York Times called At Risk in a Culture of Normal that shares the statistical um, reality of how people with neurodiversity are uh, bullied uh, and shamed in uh, a culture that kind of values the, the normal above uh, all else. Um, and that bullying has dramatic consequences, you know. Um, Self-harm rates for young people with uh, neurodiversity are uh, exponentially higher than young folks without. Uh, and that comes from that social stigma and social uh, marginalization. And so it's important for us. That one works? Yeah, right now. cool. Uh, so it's important for us, uh, thank you, um, to, 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 to call it what it is and to uh, not just uh, write off uh, that phenomena as kids being kids. It, it's not kids being kids. Uh, it's a form of, of uh, discrimination against a minority group that should not stand. Uh, and we need to call it that. Uh, and not only do we need to call it that, but we need to uh, embed uh, in our conversation that's happening right now around the country, around uh, diversity and inclusion, we need to include in that conversation the idea of neurodiversity. Uh, and we need to embed in our diversity programming, uh, not just uh, information, uh, and processes and policies around race, class, gender, sexual orientation, which we should, and that's a good thing. We also need to include ability status in that diversity conversation. But, but often that's not hop happening, you know? Uh, often I'll go to an institution and I'll look at their diversity policy, and the diversity policy mentions all of what I just said, but not ability status. You know, my alma mater, good example of this, did a five-year diversity audit, Brown University. Millions of dollars looking at the status of uh, equity and inclusion at the institution. Whole report with $200 million mapped to remediating the findings. And guess how many times disability or ability status was mentioned in that report on equity, diversity, and inclusion? Guess how many times? Zero. So, you know, we're treating this as a uh, problem in the person not as a problem in the system. And so we've done good work around elevating diversity, but we've excluded in the diversity conversation a whole group of people who should be included. And so that pertains to institutions of higher education, that pertains to corporate diversity policies, and that also pertains to school district policies. You know, I'll give you a, a really telling example for a minute. You know, um, folks on the continuum, um, uh, autism, Asperger's on the spectrum are, 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 are viciously targeted sometimes for bullying, you know? And I heard from a, a mom recently, it broke my heart, it was an email. 
And the mom said in the email, she said, you know, my son's in, in ninth grade and my son has not been invited to one birthday party ever. It, not one birthday party. And she brought this to the attention of the school and the school said, well, that's kids being kids. And then her letter went on to say, imagine for a moment if my son was a kid of color who had never been invited to one birthday party. The school would call that, rightfully so, discrimination, because that's what it is, and wouldn't tolerate it. But for this form of diversity, it was tolerated as kids being kids. So it's important for us to stop that and to understand that um, that bullying is a form of marginalization and it should be addressed or remedied through a more expansive and in inclusive diversity set of policies uh, at the institutional level. So that's kind of the big picture that I want to talk about. Let's talk about the, 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 the sort of day to day. Um, you know, there are specific social challenges that come with neurodiversity. You know, I talk fast, you know what I mean? Like, that's true. Uh, I'm not the best sometimes in making eye contact, especially when I was a kid. You know, not the best when I was a kid of like reading social cues, you know what I mean? Like, those things come from uh, the neurodiversity. Uh, and so we have an obligation to build a more inclusive system uh, and, and help young people understand those things and have more empathy for it. But also, we can help young people navigate the day to day better. You know, there's direct instruction around social skills. Uh, that direct instruction on social skills uh, has a high level of, of impact when you look at the research. Uh, and it's just about uh, making explicit some of the things that we take for granted. You know, like you make eye contact when you're having a conversation. You know, you try to ask people questions about themselves and not just talk about yourself, all of those things, right? So direct instruction around social skills is a practical tool to help kids manage social relationships in a more powerful way. But that can't be the only thing we do. At the same time, we got to be talking about this larger systemic issue where the kid like me is called the problem kid. And then when I go to the playground, guess what I hear from kids? I hear, what's your problem? which was learned behavior in a particular system. So let's walk and chew gum. Let's talk about the big thing as it comes to, to bullying and, and kids not being kids, but let's also equip young people with some very sp specific and explicit skills to manage social relationships. Okay, right on, great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, so elephant in the room, you know. Uh, we, uh, we, we have uh, a system designed in the 19th century uh, to make uh, widgets for a factory, you know. Uh, and we all have inherited that system at no fault of our own. And educators are uh, stuck in that system and disempowered by that system in the same way that children are. So how do we manage an imperfect reality that we did not create nor that we have control over, you know, uh, as, as educators, as people who care about uh, public uh, education and education writ large. Uh, so again, as my mind tends to go, I'm gonna go big picture, then I'm gonna go to the day to day. Let's start with the big picture. Uh, you know, we have the, the system that we have, uh, uh, not by accident, you know, we have the system that, that we have uh, by the decisions that have been made by policymakers, you know, uh, and, and many of those policymakers who make the decisions that drive the system that we have are elected officials. You know, sometimes we forget that uh, no child left behind, right, was bipartisan legislation by Senator Ted Kennedy, the primary leader of that. And that created the system that we have now in many respects of a standardization teach to the test doubling down on that 19th century model. You know, we forget that uh, the Obama, Obama administration doubled down on No Child Left Behind uh, and uh, continued a, a sort of standardized uh, teach to the test mentality. So my point in saying all that is this is not a partisan issue, but it is a politics issue. And it is an issue of who do we elect to 
uh, make decisions about what kind of school we want. And the good news in that is we can vote on that issue, right? And we should vote on that issue because it's an issue uh, that matters. So at the highest level, we can uh, 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 use our, uh, our, our, our uh, franchise rights as citizens of this country to uh, uh, hold policymakers accountable for a better educational environment. We should do that. But at one level down, I want to talk about something that is doable for us as advocates again. You know, special education, as I alluded to in my presentation, is an unfunded mandate, right? Uh, it has never been fully funded by the federal government. No administration, Republican or Democrat, has ever fully funded the IDEA. And there's a movement afloat right now to uh, encourage, nudge, advocate uh, any presidential candidate of any party to commit to fully funding the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So I want to encourage us to join that movement uh, and to be advocates for that. But I want, to, uh, I want us, our, that movement to go further because not only should we fully fund IDEA, but we should use those resources to create universally designed classrooms. Because that teacher who said, hey, I got 40 kids in my room, uh, what, what can I possibly do around the 40 differences that exist? Well, if that teacher had resources to differentiate instruction, if a lot of that money that was being spent on segregated special education came in to lift all boats, we could have a universally designed system. Not with more money, but with the money that's already been assigned and voted by people. So that's really important for us to think about at a systems level, right? Advocate for the education system we want using our vote and also specifically advocate for universal design with fully funding of the IDEA. So that's that. Now let's talk about day to day, right? Because I know that what I just talked about is out of our control. We can't change that tomorrow. Y'all got to go back to your classroom and face an imperfect world. So what do you do in an imperfect world? Uh, well, there's a couple things. You know, number one, uh, those accommodations that I talked about, you know, uh, I talked about speech to text, text to speech. I talked about active learning. And I talked about creating multiple ways for students to show their knowledge, right? Time extensions on exams being one of those, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Those accommodations that I talked about, guess how much money they cost? N nothing. You know, vast majority of kids come to school nowadays or have access to some cell phone that is talk text to speech or speech to text, you know? You can buy uh, used cell phones for $10 that facilitate this. Resources is not the, the barrier. It's a cultural paradigm barrier in our mind, right? So for the teachers that want to do this and are stuck in a flawed system, we can make some low-hanging fruit decisions. That doesn't change everything, but you know what? It makes a difference for kids. You know, Mr. R was stuck in that system. Mr. R had 40 kids, and yet he made a commitment that those kids would hear what was right with them. That didn't cost any money. So let's understand and name those things that are still doable within a flawed system. And I know that the accommodations, not all of them, but most of them, uh, don't require us reimagining the school environment for them to still make a difference. I talked about those already. I talked about a strength orientation. We can still do that. You know, I know teachers that have strength boards. You know, every kid has a board for themselves where other students map their strengths. That stuff matters, you know? And it didn't require a revolution. Uh, and you know what? Something else I wanna say, I didn't talk about this morning that we can do with limited resources in a flawed system is we can commit to building relationships with kids. You know, we know more than ever that all it takes is one meaningful adult. There's a great research study from uh, uh, University of Chicago. Uh, University of Chicago studied a group of vulnerable young people, most of them from the south side of Chicago, from the time that they were 14 to the time that they were 30. Largest longitudinal study of its kind. It wanted to know what is the intervention that makes the difference for some kids that beat the odds when too many kids become statistics. And unequivocally, the research study concluded that the intervention that mattered most is having one meaningful adult in your life. And according to that research study, guess who that meaningful adult was more often than not? T 
features, right? That's an amazing thing. Not, not five meaningful adults, not four meaningful adults, not three, not two, one. You know, one person connecting and caring about a young person, you know? So being that person that's connecting uh, and a connector, being that person that's unearthing the good and naming the good, and being that person who accommodates students with those things I talked about. Hey, if you leave here today, even in the flawed system that we have, and you do that, you will make a difference in kids' lives. Now, with that said, you know what? We got to do that day to day, but it is imperative that we all elevate out of the day to day and that we start to be advocates for a better system, you know, because too many kids are being left behind and disengaged. And you know what? It's not just the kids who struggle in school. You know, there's a, the Gallup organization. Uh, most of us know the Gallup organization from polling, right? But the Gallup organization, well before political polling, has done something since like the 1930s called the Student Engagement Survey. So they poll high school kids all around the United States about how engaged in school they are. And the last time the student engagement happened in 2019, student engagement was the lowest on recorded history. The number one word used to describe school by students was guess what? Bored, you know. Uh, we can't have an entire generation of young folks being disengaged uh, in their education. Uh, and that requires a, a change in parenting culture for sure, no question about it, but it also requires a, a change in education culture. Uh, and it requires us to reimagine education for the 21st century. So let's do the things we can day to day, but ultimately let's be advocates for, for a bigger vision uh, as well. Okay, what else we got? Mm. Yeah, well, you know, that whole, like, uh, that whole, like, deal with the devil, you know what I mean? Like, that's what, it, you know, hey, if you want your needs met as a hu unique human being, you got to pathologize yourself. But let's hang out with that for a second, you know, opposed to saying human beings have a right to learn in their way, every human being, you know, and that we have an ethical and moral obligation to meet the needs of diverse humans. We say you can be different only if you're sick, you know? And in some ways that keeps the whole system in place, you know what I mean? Because then it's a steam valve that makes people go over there and say I'm less than and deficient to get their needs met. So people don't wanna do it or they gotta fight for it, you know? And so I understand that and the struggle of that. Uh, and at a high level, I'm deeply disturbed by that. You know, what's the North Star we should be gravitating towards? Well, the nurse, North Star we should be gravitating towards is an IEP for all, you know, an individualized education plan in its highest aspiration, not in its deficit model now, but the idea that, that we all have something unique about ourselves, you know. And I have a lot of optimism that we can build that kind of system, you know, leveraging certain, not all, but certain technologies moving forward. I think we can get there. So let's hold on to that. But in the day to day for that uh, mom and that 17 year old, uh, you know, a couple things. Uh, you know, number one, uh, there, are, there are many resources to uh, get the uh, assessments that you need. Again, that's a big old class barrier. Let's call it what it is, you know. Um, that's expensive, that takes time. Uh, that, that's uh, a, cl a class problem, you know, uh, it, it resources are in the way of that. Uh, I don't know about locally here, but I know in many communities where I work, there are uh, coalitions of people that will support uh, people without the resources uh, to get private assessments, to get private assessments, whether that be through a community college or university, or whether it be the pro bono work of folks in the private sector. So if anyone in this room uh, knows of something along those lines, you know, uh, please share that uh, uh, as the day goes on. Uh, maybe informally uh, share it with me and I can give a little shout out to it via email, et cetera. Uh, so let's work those uh, networks. Um, the other thing that I would say is uh, uh, often uh, an assessment done by the school, um, there's a vested interest in 
not having that assessment necessarily uh, percolate up to the services. Uh, and you can have the same assessment done by the school analyzed by somebody else that comes to a different conclusion, and that's important to do. And another thing that I would say is a lot of parents hear that, uh, you know, the kid is too smart for services, things along those lines, you know, uh, doing too well, quote unquote, in certain places to get services. Uh, and that's not the definition of the law. The definition of the law, so everyone's on the same page here, coming from uh, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which created IEPs, to the Americans with Disabilities Act, which created 504 plans. It's not about performance, but discrepancy between performance and potential. Discrepancy. And that matters because, you know, there are some kids that are doing good enough, but they could be thriving and they have a right to services. So if you're getting that message, whoever you are that may have answered that, asked that question, uh, that is your right. And there are advocates, I've met advocates already today, who can help you navigate that system and can help you uh, uh, not listen to maybe the half-truths uh, or half-falsehoods you are hearing as you try to get the services you need and to get uh, the letter of the law applied for your child uh, so if you're an advocate in the room, because I don't know who asked this question, does anyone here, uh, somebody I met earlier, she may have left, is doing private advocacy work in this room? Right on. You're doing good IEP stuff. So if that's an issue that you're struggling with, uh, that is so cool. Thank you for raising your hand. Thank you for the work you do. And if uh, you ask that question or if it resonates with you, I hope you don't mind if somebody comes and says a quick hello to you. Is that cool? Okay. Right on. Thank you very much. Okay. What do we got? What are my thoughts on uh, medication? Uh, help or hindrance? Um, so uh, let, me, let, me, let me talk about my personal journey with, uh, with medication um, in a couple different uh, ways uh, for a couple different things. Uh, and then let me pull out of that and talk about my uh, larger point of view. Uh, so from a personal journey perspective, just to kind of get that out of the way, you know, I've been prescribed, you know, medication throughout my entire journey, like most recently yesterday, you know, uh, uh, but, 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 but it was not a tool that my parents uh, wanted me to use when I was uh, a child. Uh, and in my uh, college years, it was not a tool that I thought I needed to use. Uh, nor in my professional life because of the way that I was able to uh, create and structure uh, my environment. Uh, so that's my journey, you know. I'm not, uh, I'm speaking from personal experience of having it be uh, a discourse in my life, but not having ever used that tool. So with that said, uh, personal experience caveat aside, let me talk about my overall thinking. So, you know, I've been on a roller coaster about this. Uh, issue for the 20 years since I first started speaking about my experience uh, when uh, Learning Outside the Lines, that book came out. Uh, and when I say roller coaster, you know, I've been all over the, uh, uh, the continuum of extremes, you know. I've been on one side of it, you know, that's about like, okay, you know, uh, this is a, a documented brain difference uh, and, and medication uh, is used for other differences, brain challenges, so maybe it would help. And then I've gone all the way over to the other side of conspiracy theory, you know, that like this is manufactured by global, uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical industry, you know what I mean? Um, and then I've been every place in the middle. And so where I'm at today is, is pulling, I think, some truth from uh, that sort of ideological spectrum, right? Uh, based on my lived experience with other humans and based on the research that I know. So let me share with you uh, where I've landed. Number one, number one. Uh, there is no uh, disputing that uh, uh, stimulant-based medication, as well as a whole continuum of psychotropic medication, depression, anxiety, uh, is uh, over-prescribed in this country, you know. Um, you juxtapose the U.S. to any other industrialized nation, and we are prescribing stimulant-based medication uh, three to four to five times 
more, right? Based on uh, statistical uh, data, right? Um, so that's just a, a fact, you know? Um, you know, there's no disputing the fact that a part of what drives that um, uh, uh, demand is manufactured demand. You know, we are the only uh, country, developed country in the world that allows direct to consumer marketing around pharmaceuticals. That, that's just a fact, you know? Uh, and uh, there's a message uh, beamed into people's minds that this is a way to fix your kid. I remember an ad for uh, ADHD medication and it said uh, ADHD, you know, in big letters, A-D-H-D. And then it said, almost done with my homework, dad. You know, implying that a stimulant-based medication that in some forms has its derivative of speed, right? Should be prescribed to children to get homework done, you know, like that's not right, you know, and that's, that's wrong. Um, so those are some facts. And the other fact that we know is that uh, in double blind, uh, placebo based, a gold standard of empirical research, uh, a number of interventions are as effective or more than stimulant based medication. We know that exercise, it is as effective, you know, as stimulant-based medication. We know that uh, diet around uh, sugar and refined sugar and controlling that is as effective. Uh, we know that as it pertains to uh, certain psychotropic medications, anxiety, depression, we know that talk therapy is as uh, effective. Uh, and we know uh, that mindful meditation is uh, as effective right and then the last thing we know is modifications to the environment is as effective right so there's a whole bunch of other things you know that we should be exploring so you may hear me say that you may hear me say over prescribed manufactured demand and other alternatives and say well dude you're not all over the continuum you're in one camp and and that's not true because the one thing that i will say is that there are many people for whom i've met and I know that this is bared out in the macro level research for whom in combination with the things I just described, medication is a powerful and meaningful tool. There are medication for uh, ADHD, for anxiety and depression. We know that there are some people for whom that has saved and transformed uh, their life. So the net outcome of that analysis of bouncing all around is to think about it as a tool, you know? It, it's not like a cure for a brain disorder, you know what I mean? Like it's not, and I know it's been sold that sometimes. I don't know if anyone's ever hold, heard the, 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 the uh, analogy, which is false, of if your kid was diabetic, you know, you would give them this, you know? Like that's a false analogy. E even Russell Barkley, don't know if you know him, but he is probably the most uh, deficit oriented advocate for ADHD being a brain disorder. No ifs, ands, or buts, nothing good about it. It is a problem in a kid's brain. Even Russell Barkley has said that there is no ADD when a kid is playing video games. What other disease do you know that can be cured by video games, right? That is an acknowledgement that it's inherently contextual. It's inherently about what you're uh, uh, trying to achieve and what task is at hand. So, so it's not a, a, a cure for a brain disorder. It's a tool that can help you manage your environment. And it's a tool that should be used in context with the other tools that I talked about. But it's a tool that if you use it and if it's helpful or if your child uses it and it's transformative, you should never be ashamed of. And we shouldn't make other people feel ashamed of it. And the guiding light for me uh, as an advocate and ultimately as a parent is, is this tool transformative? Not, is it almost done with my homework, dad, making life a little easier? That's wrong. Is it the kid who used to run into traffic and almost got killed by a car and now they don't? That's transformative. Is it the person who couldn't get out of bed, but now they can? That's transformative, right? Those are the kind of things in which this tool was originally meant for. And those are the things that we should celebrate. We should create access for because not only is it over prescribed, but in some communities it's under prescribed. 
because there's not access to the information. So that's how we should think about it. That should be our North Star, a tool, a tool among others, a tool to use if it has transformative impact on somebody's sense of self and their opportunity uh, in the world. Okay, right on. We got, we got like one more or what, what's up? Last one, cool. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I do. Uh, I, you know, the, 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 uh, the 19th century factory uh, economy required a 19th century factory school. Uh, and you can put pictures side by side each other of a, a factory model of, of industrial output and a school environment. And if I didn't tell you which one was which, and there were no uh, people in it, you would not be able to tell the difference because they were mapped one to one together. Uh, and the uh, factory model uh, required standardization of production and standardization of people. Uh, and uh, that's the system that we have uh, today. Uh, and I, 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 so, I so hoped for so long that I would be out here Tell, talking about the bad old days, you know? Like, I remember the first talk I ever gave 20 years ago, uh, more, right before Running Outside the Lines came out. And I was, like, in the back, kind of prepping about how I would say, you know what, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell some stories that I'm sure don't happen anymore, you know? And, and, and after that talk, people came up to me and said, hey, there's a reading group in my school tomorrow. I, I'm hiding in the bathroom. Well, there's all the desks, you know? And it's still something that's deeply entrenched. You know, the RAND Corporation, which is a, um, a think tank, they did a study of school classroom environments that came out last year. And, and the RAND Corporation uh, found that on average, students spend 75% of the school day sitting still, passively observing, absorbing information. On average, young people have 14 minutes of recess, right? And then the number one punishment, if you can't sit still for 75% of the day, is to lose, guess what? <laughs> Your 14 and a half minutes of recess. This is 2019, y'all. We've doubled down on sit down, you know? And, and it's wrong for all the reasons I talked about today because it hurts kids. It's not how kids learn. But it's perhaps most deeply wrong because we don't got the factory economy anymore. We have the creative economy. And I know that that has caused disruption and dislocation more than ever. But what is going to lead to thriving in a changing economic landscape is a different set of cognitive skills. And those different set of cognitive skills uh, are going to be built or not built based on the type of school environments we build. And there's great inequity in that, you know? I was in Palo Alto the other day, you know, heart of Silicon Valley. And all of those tech executives are sending their kids to no desk schools. They're sending their kids to places where kids aren't sitting and getting all day long. They're moving and doing. They're actively solving problems opposed to regurgitating memorized information. And the elite of the world are fighting for that for their kids. Well, it can't just be for them. It's got to be for everybody. And we got to fight for that, you know, because uh, you can't survive or thrive in a changing world uh, in a 19th century approach to learning. And the good news is more than ever, we have uh, resources, knowledge, information, to reimagine what that learning experience is because it ain't working for so many different factions. You know, it's not working for the kids with learning differences, sure. But do you know who has dropout rates that exceed the dropout rates of kids with learning differences? Guess what? Gifted kids. The kids supposed to be thriving the most in learning drop out at greater rates than other kids. So it's not working for either end of the continuum. And it's not, when it's not working for anybody, it means it's time is up and we got to build something new. 
And building that something new uh, is an all hands on deck thing, you know? It's an all hands on deck thing, your day to day as an educator, even if you can't change the system, but being that ambassador to the idea that everyone's got a strength and talent. And it's an all hands on deck for us as citizens, as people engaged in our democracy, and we have a chance to build a better world in the type of learning that we prioritize. So thank you all uh, so very much. Let me tell you how to continue the dialogue with me. Uh, uh, I'm gonna hang out as I said, so come say hello. But I know you all have busy lives and you may need to move on in your day. I appreciate the time you've given already. But the two ways to continue the conversation with me are one, uh, come find me uh, on the social media stuff, you know. Uh, all the different social platforms, it's the same thing. Uh, the Jonathan Mooney, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. You know, I'm, I'm always, uh, you know, posting of, uh, you know, me at the beach, kind of living the dream. You know what I mean? Uh, that's, not what, that's not what I'm posting. I'm posting where I'll be speaking, issues I care about, ways to be an advocate and, 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 and fight for this stuff that we all care about. So find me there. Uh, but if you got a question, you know, uh, uh, don't hit me up o o on the social stuff. Hit me an email, please. It just makes it easier for me to respond to you personally. Uh, so my email is my name. It is Jonathan Mooney, which is J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, uh, uh, and it's M-O-O-N-E-Y, Jonathan Mooney at me, which is M-E dot com. So Jonathan Mooney at me dot com. Find me in the social. My thanks to this fine university here. Uh, my thanks to the Alumni Center for being wonderful hosts. My thanks to the Learning Support Center for all of their commitment uh, to being uh, inclusive of learning diversity on this campus. And most importantly, uh, to the Burnetts, thank you all. You represent what it means to put your resources where your values are. Uh, I hope there are uh, 20 more of these, and I have been honored to be a small part of the mission that you're on. So let's give them a round of applause and then come say hello.